Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. We will have an executive session. We do have an executive session tonight, guys. Mm -hmm. um, approve the minutes of Monday, November 22nd. I have a motion. So move. And a second. second it. Any discussion on the minutes? All right, hearing none, so move. Um, board, <coughs> board correspondence. Okay. Hearing none. Um, board development series. We That's just a placeholder. That's just a placeholder, okay. But I, I can give you a quick update. Uh, so the VSBA indicated that their trainer would be up and ready to begin again in March. So I expect it will be ready to roll again with board development in March, just so everyone knows. Yeah. Yeah, and um, if you, if you read about his name is Phil Gore, and he's been in the educational business for a long time, uh, Seattle, Texas. He's got a phenomenal skill set that I think is going to be right what this whole state needs. and. I'd like to be in the front of the line to get him um, working with us again because we've got a lot of good business and important business, and he sounds like somebody that could really add a skill set that would be helpful. So that's that's a real positive note to me. Nice. All right. Are there any public comments? I think there's only one. The phone number is the only one on, right? All right, hearing no public comments, moving right along, Jamie. Oh, oh, we get one. Ethan. You're muted, Ethan. You're muted. Yeah, sorry, I missed, I missed board comment. You went right by it. Um, uh, uh, is that, is this a, can I jump in on here? Well, this is, well, it was public comment, but go ahead. What do you got? So we don't have, oh, I see we just have board correspondence and communication. So it's not really board comment like we have in our local meetings. Right. Well, okay. no, it is. You, do you have something? Board correspondence. Uh, just a, it's a nitpickly little thing that I noticed is not really bothering tonight so much. Um, the last full meeting, we went through um, uh, almost all the board members who were virtual had their uh, video cameras off. And I just think it's a sign of respect when we're asking our staff to show up in person with masks that we at least be so they can see responses and see us that we're actually there. I mean, obviously, if you have to head off, but just as a courtesy, I ask that people keep their video on and that we, you know, we attend the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. All right. Um, okay, now it's your turn. Uh, reports. Uh, so you have my report in hand. Um, uh, Orly, I just want to add, Onda and I both attended uh, the, the VSA uh, sponsored um, really a really good informative informational series on for the task force that did the, the waiting study. Um, and so we spent two hours um, today hearing an overview of that and some questions and answers. My takeaway from that is is that you know they've put a ton of time and effort in to the waiting study for equity. Um, and of course, free and reduced lunch is going to impact the wait, the waiting more so. And they're looking at really two proposals. One, that's gonna change the weight of students for equalized pupils. And in general, for RSU, that is a benefit to us when you look at tax rate. Almost overwhelmingly in each district will benefit from that. The other one, Strafford is a slight adjustment for you not to the positive, but it's like, it's like very, it's like very small, just so you know. Um, it was looking larger to begin with. And Granville Hancock, they did a nice job of making certain they reported your free and reduced lunch rates in the new draft. So that was a, a huge benefit for you. The other one is more of a, like a mainstream mainstream grant where they'll fund students based on a dollar figure for dis different like areas where they believe it costs more to 
to educate students. So free and reduced lunch rate um, is an example, middle school students. Um, and so with that funding mechanism, I would tell you that um, there's a little more of an impact at Granville Hancock, Stacy. Um, and but in general, for the rest of the rest of the districts, you would benefit from this proposal. So Rochester Stockbridge, First Branch Unified District, Sharon and White River Unified District, you you would benefit on both proposals. Um, and so the next step is, is this report will go to the legislature. They'll continue to take more feedback um, and they'll see if they'll look to act. The other big takeaway for me was they do understand it's going to they're proposing the concept of a five year phase in. Um, it wouldn't be an immediate, uh, you know, this is the new funding mechanism. They would have some type of way to phase it in. Um, so I think it's just important for us to continue to follow the conversation. You know, certainly there's some districts that this really does impact their funding significantly. Um, for us in rural communities where we're, we're trying to do a really good job of building an MTSS and best support our students, um, for us, it really is looking at equity and how to better support our tax base. Um, and so I'll continue to give you guys written updates now monthly on this too. Um, but I would say I left there feeling optimistic in what this could mean for our supervisory union and for most of our districts. And again, uh, Stratford and Granville Hancock, either way, it was not one way Granville Hancock benefited, the other way not. But it wasn't a significant change, Stacy. In Stratford, you guys um, will not benefit from this in either proposal, but it's not significant. It's less than a percent impact on um, tax rates. So, but in some districts, we could see it impacts tax rates to the positive by upwards of almost 13% in certain wow. districts. So it, it could be significant. So just stay tuned. Um, you know, some questions were, were asked about just ensuring that these calculations took into to effect for us that are sending districts, which most of us are. Based on what I saw in the second draft, it seemed like they got their figures quite right versus the first draft. I had a lot of concerns with the first draft that came out, but the second draft, um, it seems to be much tighter. The other thing I wanted to just add is, of course, there was a, a lot of discussion around social media about Friday, December 17th. Um, I, I uh, met with my colleagues, uh, many of which who did put out information about Friday, December 17th. And a lot of that was based on actual indications that they had around threats, possibly to the schools within their, their SU or district, we had no imminent threats. There was no directed threats at any schools within WRVSU. And on top of that, it was identified that this was not a credible threat in general um, by our police um, and actually the agency of education had done a great, great deal of work too. I did give your principals talking points that they could speak to parents and um, staff about um, and chose not to put out a Mass communication, because number one, I'm learning quickly that not everyone reads my communications uh, fully. And so I was worried that I could create more panic by that if folks didn't read it all the way through. And I would actually say, you know, hindsight, some of my colleagues said that that actually is what had occurred in their SUs, is that more panic was created based on the communication. Um, and again, I don't know if everyone reads all the details in the communication. and so. I did talk to a couple families personally who uh, just had questions as to the why, and I explained my reason, like I'm, I'm talking to you about not wanting to create more panic and or upset in our already stressed uh, you know, community as it is. Um, and, and so therefore, knowing that there was no imminent threat, I, didn't, I, did, I chose not to communicate it. So I just wanted to address that. Um, and you know, it's the, it's the final couple of days before break. Um, we're looking forward to it. Uh, the other thing I think we got to watch closely now is COVID. Uh, our numbers continue to be uh, pretty significant across the SU. 
TESTA stays working. We're keeping our kids in our buildings. Uh, we're not seeing spread again within the buildings um, when we do test to stay, so our mitigation efforts are working, but certainly you can see community numbers are high. Um, and so, you know, my hope is, is that our vaccination numbers will continue to increase um, because when we have students vaccinated fully, um, it results in if they're asymptomatic, we don't have to test to stay. And so the capacity figure is the issue right now. You should be very proud of all your schools. Um, we have test to stay teams up and running in all of our, our schools now. Um, and we've implemented tests to stay uh, in all but one school at this point across the SU. And so, and it's gone without a hitch. Um, so those are the updates I have in regards to COVID. Uh, the other thing I wanted you to know, and we'll talk more about it in the budget, is that the curriculum development position that we have been talking about um, previously was removed from the budget. What we did do is we provided leadership stipends uh, for different content areas in the budget. One of the things I don't think we have to discuss tonight, but I'd like us to discuss in the future, is do we consider adding an admin position using ESSER money knowing we would fade it in two years? Um, that's when ESSER money would fade. And so what I heard was this idea of, you know, how do we fund it, number one. Two, I did hear folks acknowledge our curriculum needs work. But three, I went back with my team and really said, well, we don't need this position forever. This is more of we need to get our curriculum addressed um, and get it secured and, and have a, a really strong, transparent curriculum that our students and families deserve and teachers for that matter. And so I believe that work can be accomplished in the next two years. And then the idea would be what you'll see in your budget are these leadership stipends for content areas like you folks had suggested. That work would be ongoing for revision, reflection, and refinement um, on an annual basis. So that's why we budgeted those funds locally. Um, and again, I think, uh, aside from the budget would be us discussing that other position, uh, but that decision, we don't need that tonight by any means. So I just wanted uh, to highlight that as well and take any questions folks have. Um, I have a question. Um, I've heard rumble that legislature is going to vote to uh, change how we do town meeting again this year possibly. I have not heard that. On January 4th, it's supposed to be one of the things that they take up. It was talked about in Cumbridge. To possibly be able to vote in like May when you can do outdoor meetings again instead of in person because of the uptick in COVID. Has anybody else heard about that in their communities? You, you too? Okay. And I just wondered if we were going to think along those lines too after they have the vote to talk about doing that in the different communities. I mean, I think if Tumbridge decided to, then I, as a town, I would think that we would want to as a school board as well. I think we should discuss in all your local districts. As each local district. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Stacey. Yeah, she put in the link to. There was an article in Digger, Stacy. Yeah. I missed it. You know, they're talking about having, again, two options the Australian ballot or being able to delay it until the weather is more moderate so that people can be outdoors and that sort of thing. You know, but. I'm just giving you a heads up that that's. No, thanks for the heads up, and I think we should take it up in each local district meeting. It's important to note right now we, that we have no authority as a, as a local district or board to warn an Australian ballot. That, had, that, that legislation has sunset. So right now we would plan to act in person. And in each district, you can decide if you want to delay your warning of the meeting um, pending that legislation. We'd be tight around warning it for those that warn in, in town meeting. But if they take and act quickly and swiftly, then it probably could January give us. January 4th. January 4th. I thought you said 24th. 4th is great. Nope, January 4th. All right. Yeah, so we'll take it up at each local district. Okay. Uh, Meg. Um, hi, thank you. I have two questions. One is um, I heard on the radio that there were extra rapid tests in a statewide kind of way and that they were looking to that were that were going to expire and that some districts were going to be sending them home with families and i wondered if that's something that might happen in our su 
Uh, great question, Meg. We're actually barely going to make it through Wednesday without running out of test. Yeah. Uh, just because we have so much testing happening right now. So actually, and we borrowed um, from Sharon Academy. We're gracious and actually lend us um, a bunch of their kits uh, over the weekend. So, no, we won't have extra kits. What I will do, though, is send home PCR tests with students and certainly promote the PCR testing. We have mail, mail home test. Um, and so yeah. that is something that we've indicated to the nurses to um, certainly support. Awesome, thank you. And then the second question I had was about the waiting study. And I, I mixed up about which meeting I'm in when, but I was wondering if you could bring that up at our local meeting. Absolutely. Right you might've already done it. I just am confused about. Yep. Now that we have the figures, I'll be talking about how it impacts each local district at your local meeting. Thank you. That's all for me. Okay. Anything else for Jamie before we move on? Bill. Yeah, I just want to uh, commend uh, uh, Jamie and his team. Uh, the, the third to the end paragraph talks about community outreach and, and, and having an aggressive program to inform uh, the community about what's happening at the SU level as well as in our, our schools. And I just think, and the creation of a new website, an enhanced website, uh, more, more um, user-friendly website. And, and these things are very important. If we're going to exist and excel, we've got to grow. And it, I see every student that's out there and the parents are going, gee whiz, should we have our son or daughter go into uh, the elementary school, the public, or should be private, or should be homeschooled, they're influenced by what they read and what they know. And we cannot assume that they're totally informed when they make their decision. And I think it's, it helps all our students and our faculty and our bottom line, quite honestly, if we can encourage every potential student and parent to to, to look at us seriously. And I think the outreach that Jamie's talking about is a, a, a real strong building block for that end. Did Don have a question? John, did you have a question at one point? Or maybe I answered it. I thought I saw your hand go up. No? Okay. All right. On Okay, thank you. Uh, um, you all have my report as well. I don't think there's uh, that much to... To repeat, just to say, um, we've well, you know had report cards and progress reports head home uh, in the last uh, bit of time, um, which has been a really it's another helpful reflection on where um, where we are at this point in the year, uh, and a little bit more I guess as to what Jamie was saying about the work we have to do around proficiencies and, and standards, and just making sure that um, those are as consistent as possible and, and match up to what our expectations are for students at this point in the year and at the end of the year, and so that's. Um, to continue part of work that we will be doing SU-wide. Uh, I'll talk about the thing that both Annette and I, I think both talked about, because I get to go first, but we had this great, <laughs> we had a great, uh, we had a great session, uh, two, I think two weeks ago with our um, special educators uh, and paraeducators and interventionists around math. And again, you've heard a lot of math from me, um, but it was, it was a, I think it was a really um, excellent opportunity to see sort of how we can use some of the consistent um, tools we have out there for kids um, who are in a variety of different places with their uh, knowledge and skills in math and, and really try to serve them with something that's pre um, really consistent uh, for their own learning. Um, and we got really good feedback from everyone who was engaged in uh, um, a, an interest and a commitment for them to come back in six weeks and review and say, here's how it's going, here's where I need a little bit more support, here's where my questions are, here are my, my ahas with this are. And so, we're really excited to see that. I think previously the burden has been on them to sort of pull and find different things that might match kids and um, the hands-on inquiry approach uh, with a lot of visual models and a lot of manipulatives is really, I mean, it's great for all kids and, um, and can be especially great for kids who may have some gaps and need a new way of seeing something to understand it. So we're really excited about that. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Everybody good? Easy crowd tonight, Anda. <laughs> All right. Great. Hi, everyone. We have my report as well. Um, 
the last month, uh, we didn't quite have our uh, December 1 child count done yet. Um, it's now complete and handed into the AOE. Um, so our uh, December 1, 2021 child count number is 253, um, which December 1, 2020, it was 240, so a difference of 13 students. Um, so our overall exits uh, from July 1 till uh, December 1 was a total of 27 students, um, exited in very different ways and different reasons, whether they moved or they transferred you know, out of special education back to the general ed um, population, whether they graduated um, or what you'll see in my report is a column that says dropped out of school. That doesn't mean that they came in and filled out paperwork to drop out of school per se. Um, if we have students that don't attend school, they're absent um, for a long, consistent uh, period of time, we send home what we call a FAPE letter saying your IEP and your services, your service providers are waiting for you to come and attend school, you know, let us know if there's any way we can assist you if they're 18 or we send it to the parents and say, we would love to help your family. Um, and if we do not hear back from them, um, then they do get exited. Um, so that's part of that number. Um, the next part was that we did, we had a wonderful day uh, for, for math intervention. Um, it goes back to that, the service uh, delivery model that, you know, we're trying to create where, you know, paraeducators can get specifically trained um, in programs, the same as with our, with our special educators, um, so that we have more intervention, interventionists um, and people supporting our students. So that was really exciting. Um, also, special educators had their first session with Jennifer Patnode. Um, talking about um, barriers with, you know, very specific disabilities and ways to kind of open up and provide access um, within uh, the classroom um, and in also within our interventions. Um, so they had the first session uh, this past in service day and that was fantastic. Um, we have two more to go. I had great feedback um, with that as well. Um, and I see Ethan, you have a question? Yes, yes. Um, with, with this, with this uh, uh, just to make sure uh, I understand, sure I understand. You're, saying you're saying that we have 27, we have 27 less, less students, students in special, special ed across, across the, the SU. SU. Is, that is, that is that correct? Correct. Correct. Um, um, how do we know? Um, one of the things Jamie's really emphasized is that we want to be bringing kids out of special ed and getting them into the classroom or taking care of their issues in the classroom. How do we know if some of these students are are moving because of that, or is it all because of other related issues or family issues or whatever? So for from July 1 to December 1, we had four students um, exit out of special ed and transfer back into gen ed. So we do we do track that. And maybe you, and maybe you said maybe that you said I didn't that hear it. Didn't I'm hear sorry it. if that's what you, that's said. what you said. I apologize. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Any other? Go ahead, um, Thank you for this report. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're you're comparing December first, twenty twenty to twenty twenty one. Yes. And we had a special ed two hundred and forty in twenty twenty, and we have now two hundred fifty three. So that's a that's a growth of the year thirteen that you mentioned. Right. Um, our goal, of course, is through. Uh, our, our teaching and everything else with our curriculum and our staff and our programming to decrease the number rather than increase the number. So mm -hmm. would it help me uh, think about how that extra 13 has our enrollment, overall enrollment grown as well so that it's not a meaningful percentage change or um, how do we look at that 13? Yeah, that was one of my questions as well. I'm glad you brought that up because I was I was wondering about how many students moved into our SU. 
um, that came with you know needing okay. special education yeah. services um, because uh, it did feel it did feel like a, a pretty grand number. Um, so that's one thing that I've I've asked uh, my administrative assistants when when uh, new students move in that we track that for this this next uh, August because um, that was something that was really significant for me as well and we just don't have a way to track that nicely and cleanly um, but it's definitely this because something on our radar so I was curious out of the thirteen how many were m students that moved in. We did have a significant amount. I know in terms of the loan, we had a significant amount. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Stacy, uh, I think Don beat me to the punch. So Don, you can go first. No, oh. sorry, Don. Thank you. I think you might be able to find that information you're looking at by reviewing the IEPs where they originated in the years that they've been in place. You might be able to get the information where they. Yeah, some move from out of state, so we have to actually do um, a whole initial eval. And some of those students do not qualify in for Vermont standards when they do move in from out of state. So it's one of those that we have to tr we have to find a tracking mechanism for that. So we've had it go both ways. We've had a lot of students move in from New Hampshire and a couple from Maine. I do know that. Stacy. Oh, Stacy. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Annette. Uh, I wanted to say thanks for putting these numbers together. I don't think I've seen them passed like this in the past, and I find it really useful. Um, echoing Bill's request to see them as percentages so that we can see how they compare to the general population over time would be, would be great. Um, also, you know, five students dropping out, understanding that that has a broader meaning than what I understand it to yeah. mean. But five students dropping out of school of 240 is you know, 2% or something. Um, and so I would want to know if that is uh, the same throughout the, the general ed population or if that's, if that's tracking a little higher um, and just to continue tracking it in percentages so that we can see kind of what it more broadly reflects would be helpful. But thank you very much. This is great to see. Okay. Um, anything else? All right, uh, Director of Technology. So uh, Ray actually has the night off. <laughs> he took the day off and he was gonna come back tonight and I said, absolutely not, you took the day off. So I told him I would entertain any questions folks may have about his report. All right, Mr. Forgoodman. I'm very glad you told him not to come back. <laughs> <laughs> He deserves a whole day. Me too. All right, Tara. You all have my report. It outlines our January due dates for both business office and the school for food authority. We did also um, have a release for the federal equipment grant that we will be applying for also under the SFA that came in after I did this report. So that's my only actual update there. And then my discussion items are later on in the agenda. Any question about Tara's report? Sorry, right. I'm a newbie here. Um, Tara, your first item here, um, um, end of open enrollment. Yep. Help me here, what, what does that mean? That's our benefit system. So our benefits renew as of January 1, so our staff can choose to change their health plans if they want to gotcha. as of January 1. Yep. Makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, policy committee, we, we, haven't, we haven't had a meeting since our last. We haven't had a new meeting. I think we're working on getting another one on the schedule, or we may have one scheduled. We don't have one scheduled. You, we got to work on it. The the. If you guys go to the SU board calendar for January, now that we're in negotiations um, and uh, special meetings for budgets and things, it's pretty full. So I got to try to figure out where we can land this policy um, committee. It may be that we're back to trying to meet before this meeting, possibly. Okay. Um, just because it's it's that work 
fairly well for us before and to get that some had, work done. And we just changed it because we had a... Yeah, we had that other policy, the anti-racism policy that was taking more time, so we may need to look at getting back to that. Mm -hmm. um, Superintendent's Evaluation Committee, I just received the contract from the VSBA um, that we approved, so, um, and I've asked them when they can do their first meeting date, um, so I will be in touch shortly. I, I just got it Friday and emailed them back, so as soon as I have that, I will let that committee know. Um, negotiations Council. Um, we have a meeting scheduled for January. Well, we got a meeting scheduled for tomorrow night for our work group. Right. And then we will plan, we'll meet with the teachers on January 6th. Right. So tomorrow night, work group, teachers, um, first official meeting is January 6th? Yes, yeah, second. Second official meeting. So that would be the second, second meeting, second I believe. Official, yep. We had one. Yep, second official meeting. All right, um, discussion items. Audit. So I sent to you all the FY21 draft audit for review, and I also provided a memo that just outlined a few of the highlights. So I'll answer any questions that I can offhand. Anybody got questions on the audit that they were sent? Otherwise, I have to say that this audit cycle has been the best since I joined White River Valley Supervisory Union. We got a lot of work done, and I'm very happy with the results. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I want to compliment Tara and her team. Um, Page 99, Section 1, Summary of Auditor's Results. And Tara has summarized it by saying shows there were no findings in our financial statements. I'm familiar with auditors going way back before some of you were born, and <laughs> they love, they feel it's their duty to find something wrong. And if they work for the overtime, it's this goes like this, but they'll always find something. That's their auditors. And to have none is is an amazing accomplishment. So if we had a bottle of champagne, this is the time to, <laughs> to pop it open yes. and, and, and drink to the, the team. That's not easy to do. Their job is to find problems. And uh, so that, I just want to compliment the team on that. That was, Thank you. That was amazing. Yes, Keep nice, it up. Nice job, team. Um, oh, no question. Go ahead, Meg. Hey, I just want to say actually thank, thanks to Bill because I look at these things, it's, um, they're really confusing. So it's great to have that little tidbit of context. Is it Bill? We haven't actually met in person. It's Bill, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, to, to kind of have an understanding of where, where we're at. So nice job, team, and thank you for that context. Okay. All right, 23 budget. Okay, so Parker, if you could put up the PDF for SU, it is the FY23 SU budget. So Jamie has outlined the change that I made right up at the top there, um, taking out the salary for the position and adding in the leadership stipend, stipends I should say. Yeah, it's cool. Thank you. I didn't make any changes to the English language learner section. That continues to be the same. We didn't make any changes through technology, nor in the superintendent's office. None in the preschool, but down in my department for fiscal services, we did make an adjustment to the other contracted services for paychecks because we are going to start rolling out the electronic time card system with them. So that's another um, monthly fee that we will have to pay and also um, a one-time implementation fee. So I've added that into the FY23 budget and this will continue to make our payroll more efficient and more accurate, which is our ultimate goal. And we'll reduce processing time and room for manual errors because we're still currently doing 
paper time cards and paper time off request. And by going to the electronic system, um, it will save on that and also save on our administrator's time from having to process paper cards and just going into a system reviewing and approving electronic time cards. So now this time, you also, so overall, these changes results in a increase at central office of $95,091 or 5.26%. And this time I gave you the revenue side. So Parker, the next one that we need up is the WRVSU FY23 SU assessment. Kathy, you can take questions if you want, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Meg? Just a quick question. Could Jamie or Tara, if you, say you're in, imagine you're in a town meeting and a community member asks you for like a one sentence description of what that 95, 95 represents, could you rattle that off for us just real quick? Yeah, I mean, I look at it, it strengthens the curriculum department, right, by providing those teacher leader stipends. Uh, we're trying to strengthen still our business management um, and so it's an investment in the paycheck system for automated time cards. And then the rest is really just anticipated health insurance and things of that nature increases. We didn't add any other additional FTE. Um, but I think that, that that really speaks okay. to it. And, uh, you know, again, more investment in technology. I think it's an area that we were underfunding for a while. And um, it's an area that, you know, we now have a, uh, a plan, just so you, everyone knows, to be able to turn over our devices every five years. Uh, so Ray's worked hard to ensure we have a proactive plan with technology that all devices are turned over every five years. Now, Chromebooks is what we leverage. It's at a cost point that we can do that, but we continue to invest in technology infrastructure. So, Andrew? Um, for the paycheck, um, how much of it was one-time money and how much is ongoing expenses? It is $11,700 for a year for all seven of our entities and a $1,000 one-time implementation fee. Okay, so it looked like it went up from ten thousand to sixty thousand. So a lot of that was just what we've already kind of correct because for. I used to have a payroll clerk, just, and so in twenty two that expense was under my salaries, where now that right. is a contracted service. But I didn't. I didn't. Well, I'll have to go back and look. Okay, thanks. It well, the, the support, the, the, uh, if you look under fiscal services, you'll see support salaries are down and health insurance is down, Andrew. And that's that payroll clerk that was removed. Right. Okay. Thanks. Ethan? Yeah, now I got to remember what I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. What's the, uh, can you just remind me what the difference is now with these teacher stipends as opposed to? I remember it was about a hundred thousand last time we looked at the budget for the new position. And what's what's the number now? So instead of uh, budgeting for a full time FTE and benefits, which mm -hmm. would have been close to a hundred thousand, we've budgeted an additional twenty thousand to provide a leadership stipend in all content areas. And when we say all, we're looking to make certain we have teams working in all the you know the performing arts, physical education, health science, math, English language arts, global studies. We want to have a teacher leader facilitating those groups on a regular basis across all areas. Um, and so that's where that, that 20,000 comes into play. Good. Okay. So basically roughly a hundred thousand down to 20. Yep. Good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions guys? So I'll just say as Tara walks you through the revenue and she'll explain this, I don't want to take her thunder away, but 
when you see uh, Medicaid funds disappear from the revenue side, that is to make certain we're leveraging Medicaid funds for all you locally. And what we've been finding since Tara and I started is that we were budgeting all of our Medicaid funds mostly at the SU level and not having corresponding expenses to align to them. And so what that means is we didn't have a way to use the revenue you were budgeting. And so you're gonna see that the Medicaid funds are gone as a SUY revenue source. You will then see those revenue funds pop up into your local districts to cover things like school counselors and your nurses. Those, those are clearly areas we can use Medicaid funds for, for um, budgeting purposes. So you'll see those Medicaid funds now in your local districts. So I'll turn it over to Tara on the revenue set. So we're gonna focus on the bottom chart first. So Parker, if you wanna blow that up, they re just the last two columns is really what we need to focus on so they can make out the numbers if they don't have it in front of them. So it starts right off with the budgeted expenditures, which is from your first page, that $1,902,017. We have removed indirect rate, which was a cost that I could take um, to offset financial expenses for the business office for the administrations of the grants. And we're not going to be pulling that down anymore because we want, again, like Jamie said, we're trying to refocus all of our grant funds into the member districts rather at the SU level. So that's been removed. That was the 24000 our interest I've maintained at the $2,000, and that's the interest that we earn on our bank account. The Medicaid of $180,000, as Jamie explained, we've removed that, as well as the EP SDT MAC funds, which is just another um, different funding source from Medicaid that's based on moments and times that our school nurses and guidance counselors have to file with the federal government. And then down at the federal funds, we have reduced the Title II from 48 to 46. We reduced the Title I pre-K from 25 to 10. And then the 25, uh, sorry, the Title I pre-K reading math intervention from the 77 to the 75. And that's just based on our FY22 grant funds that we used for, to budget for the next fiscal year. So overall, the change in revenue um, is $345,091, which then if we go up to the top chart, that breaks down each of your individual district's assessment for that $345,000. Ethan. Could you just, and maybe it's important, um, could you just scroll down again, please? Okay, for some reason, I'm not finding the reports this time. I'm not sure what, I'm not finding the right email for finding all these. Um, could you just explain that 75 and 2000, the bottom line again? I didn't quite understand what that was. That is the Title I funding that we have for our preschool reading math interventionists. That's fully funded by the grants, and it went from seventy-seven to seventy-five thousand. Oh, that's all. Okay. Yep. Got you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Parker, if you want to move to the WRVSU FY23 SPED budget. So on this draft of the special education expenditure budget, when I was working on the assessments, I couldn't get my FY22 assessments to balance. 
I was off and I realized that my budget was off in FY22. I inadvertently deleted both FY22 and FY23 columns for um, our restorative classroom teachers. So I've added that back in. But wait, the budget you approved was accurate. Yes. And you say that. Yes. It sound yes. Like no, it was just in my first draft that I provided to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, the budget was right. Just this, the comparison wasn't. So it actually resulted in the special education budget being a reduction of $266,732 or 3.32%. So the question may be why. And so the big why was is that within our alternative programming that we have, instead of hiring um, our own folks to be like school-based clinicians in each program, which then results in you paying full salary and benefits for folks, we've contracted with uh, Claire Martin um, this year and it's, it's working quite well um, to have that they have case managers who push in and who are there to service our students all day. We can build down, they can build down Medicaid for those services. Much like many of you have heard me talk about school-based clinicians, how we have um, master's level therapists in many in, of our districts across the SU. We're able to get those folks for right around like $36,000, which and that's because they can build down on Medicaid. It's a contracted service. We don't have the benefits to pay. Mm -hmm. So instead of having folks at about 80,000, we're able to get them for about 36. And so that was a pretty significant savings. Um, and I would say that, you know, in general, Annette and I can, and the principals continue to meet with Claire Martin to strengthen our working relationship um, with them. I would say that, you know, they have, they're still struggling with some of the difficulties we have around hiring, but I can't say, for these programs, we're, we're fully staffed now, but I can't say that it'd be any different where we're sitting, right? Like, I, I can't say that that's because it's Claire Martin versus us. Um, I think that that's just the labor shortage we're all dealing with right now. Um, so I wanted you to know, this is not a decrease in services by any means, it's really just looking to leverage our community and mental health partnership with Claire Martin. Um, and that's what we've done this year. So we are actually are recognizing savings this year as currently as well, um, as it's going to help offset expenditures for next year. So I wanted to give you the why, you know, and I also think in general, my hope is that you'll continue to see our special ed costs stabilize because we are working really hard for early interventions and supports and making it more of a team approach. Um, other big thing that I think Annette would speak to is that our alternative programming here at the high school is serving, it's like a, a, probably a, About 15, 15 students. students, not all, all day long, but 15 students who are being served now here at our school versus us possibly having to tuition them out to more uh, restrictive learning environments. So that's pretty significant. Um, and certainly that's why you're seeing some savings too in your special ed expenditures. Um, last meeting, uh, the SU board voted um, uh, support and, and uh, for uh, achieving um, academic achievement goals uh, consistent with or better than the state of Vermont. And it was going to be a multi-year program led by our ABLE team sitting to my left. And um, with interim goals and everything else, and one goal was that not only were we going to achieve the average proficiency in math and, 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 uh, and English and, and reading, but we were going to have, approximately have, the, the number of students or the percentage of students, I can't remember which ones, of the level one, the, the ones that are the, have the furthest distance to travel to get to proficiency. And so my question is, is a simple one. Does this budget uh, plan that you're proposing 
um, allow us at least this next year to move in that path that we're all committed to. I would say Are yes. you comfortable with that? I am very comfortable, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that we still struggle with right now is this budget budget is budgets for more FTEs than we currently have in place. <laughs> Just like you currently have budgeted, our issue has been finding high quality yes. special educators. Um, and so we've done some contracted services to ensure that kids are getting their interventions. But our, our plan is to put a hard press on hiring. I know that Annette's starting to get resumes already, already for this. next year. Um, I have so, people waiting for us to open positions, so I'm very excited about that. That's the plan is that we'll be fully staffed and really be able to implement no, those intensive sure interventions. I want to make sure we have an obligation as a board, if we set that mm -hmm. goal that we're established and, and laid out uh, very succinctly, um, that you have the resources yes. to be able to do it. We're not saying that you right. you're just load it up to the guild. We know it's going to be hard work and diligence, and, and uh, but I think that's very important. So. To hear the thumbs up from you is very important to me, and I'm sure for the whole entire SU board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Tara. Okay. So we'll move on to the special education revenue, which is that next chart down, Parker. So Act 73 goes into effect July 1st, 2023, as you. Those who have been on the board for several years may remember that that was supposed to go into effect and was delayed. And what that is, is it changes our funding sources from the state for special education. So you'll see on the chart below, I've highlighted in bold that first row, which is the Act 73 Census Block Grant. So we will get, based on the information provided from the AOE on October 1st, 3200 $79,465. That takes place of the second line, which is our expenditure reimbursement that we used to have to file multiple times throughout the fiscal year. So that's been zeroed out. And then our second revenue stream is the extraordinary reimbursement. And they have changed the funding formula for that which results you'll see for us uh, $1,375,594. We lose our block grant. We lose the local share contribution of the block grant. We continue to have our idea B basic flow through and that number is based on this year's funding and what our projections are going to be for next year. That's also a grant through the state. And then idea B, preschool, we have some increased funding as well there, which will help offset um, some of our CODAs and SLPAs up in the expenditure budget. And we continue to have our triple E funding, which has remained pretty consistent, so we kept that the same for next year. And I have removed the $35,000 for IEP Medicaid, because again, uh, that expense is paid through the Medicaid fund and not through the special education fund. So that's just cleaning up that revenue. So the total SU special education revenues are up $42,676. And your member town assessment is down $309,408. So Parker, if you could put up the document titled WRVSU FY23 SPED Assessment. So this outlines for each of you what each individual member district's assessment is projected to be for FY23. The top box is a comparative of the FY23 proposed assessment as it compares to your FY22 assessment. And then the lower box is just each individual district's assessment, 
divided out over what your monthly payment will be. Any questions on the revenue side for special education? Okay. So, I mean, just to, to summarize, if you look, um, for some districts, you actually, due to the, the drop in special ed cost, some of your districts, your actual SU assessment between special ed and uh, the SU office will be down um, for next year. There's a, you know, first branch unified district. Their actual percentage of the SU in general is up because your ADM's up, which is good, but that mean, does mean you take on more percentage of the bills at the SU. <laughs> So you'll see that, for example, the, your guys' assessment in special ed will be down 28640 but your general assessment's up 92432 Kathy. So the difference is about 70000 but what I would tell you is not to forget, you didn't have Medicaid funds budgeted okay. at your local district as a revenue that we can now budget for your nurses. So what I'm saying is, is that the plan would be to ensure that we spread Medicaid funds out as revenue to make this a wash so that it essentially your SU assessment will be offset via hopefully <laughs> Medicaid funds where you are up a little bit. Jihad doesn't get Medicaid. Jihad doesn't get Medicaid, correct. But in general, the rest of your operating districts, that's yeah. what we'll look to do. I need that one. Big number to explain to Eric. But it is. It is. Well, I think the way to explain it too is you're growing. Right. Yes. That makes our assessment more. Okay. Any questions about the budget uh, overall? Hearing none, are we ready to vote on the budget? Audits first, Kathy. And the action items. I don't know if you want to change the order or do it in the... You could do action items. You could do audit first and then... Okay. We'll do... We're going to do action items for audit and budget. So we'll do audit first. So we talk about that first and that's what's next on the agenda. And then we'll do the budget. So do I have a motion to accept the audit? I move. Do I have a second? A second. All right. So we'll do a roll call vote. I can't see the list of names. You put the list I'm sorry, can you tell me who seconded that? Andrew. 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 Oh. All right. Thank you. Um, Aaron. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Don. Don. Did you hear me, Don? I did not. Voting on the audit, yes or no? Yes? Okay, thank you. Yes, on the audit. Thank you. Ethan? Yes. Meg? Yes. Mike Gray? Yes. Rod Rodney? Yes. Shannon? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Bill. Yes. And Kathy's a yes. So audit passed unanimously. Thank you. All right. Now on to um, budget. So I have a motion to so accept. We've got to make it specific. Okay. Tell us how you want it worded, Tara. Okay. Tara, give us the wording for the budget. A motion we need to. We the actual figure. Yep. The motion is to approve. The FY23 budget of one million nine hundred two thousand and seventeen dollars. So moved. Hold on, Tara. Can you read back the figure again, please? One nine zero two zero one seven. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll make. I'll second. You motioned already, Don. Correct. Bill yes. Bill seconded. Seconded by Ethan. Okay. 
And is there any discussion? <laughs> All kinds of. Yeah. And then it'll be a second motion for special education. Can we approve this one first? Yep. Okay. All right. So roll call vote. Here we go, guys. Aaron. Yes. Um, Andrew. Yes. Don. Yes. Ethan. Yes. Meg. Yes. Did you say Meg? Yes. Yep. Michael. Yes. Rodney. Yes. Shannon. Yes. Stacy. Yes. Bill. Yes. And Kathy's a yes. Budget passed unanimous. Four. So the second motion will be to approve the FY23 special education budget of seven million eight hundred forty four thousand eighteen dollars. So moved. Hold on. Tara, can I read that back? Yep. Seven eight four four zero one eight. Perfect. Okay. Second. So we have who moved it? Um, Ethan. Ethan moved it. Ethan, oh, Ethan, just, Ethan moved. Bill seconded. Is there any Stacey, discussion? Stacy needs the number again. She's got it now, right, Stacy? That was right. Okay. Seven eight four four zero one eight. Yep. Okay. All right. You gotta get these guys on. And that was moved by Ethan and seconded by who? Bill. 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 Thank you. All right, guys. Here we go. Um, go to the uh, top, please. Go to the top. That's okay. Aaron? Yes. Andrew? I mean, yes. Okay. Don? Grudgingly, yes. Um, Ethan? Yes. Meg? Meg, did you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Michael? Yes. Rodney? Rodney. Rodney, your turn. Yes. Thank you. Shannon? Uh, yes, if that was my name. Yes. Stacy? Yes. And Bill? Yes. Kathy's a yes. Also passed unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being patient with me getting through all the names. Um, resignation, new hires. We do have one resignation. So I have a resignation in the business office. Rose's last day will be with us on um, Friday, December 24th. At this point in her career, the quantity of accounting work that we need in our business office is not what she wants to be doing. So with deep regret. Can you speak to what that means? So yes, I mean, I can speak to what that means. Um, we have, our accounting work is primarily reconciliation of our bank accounts, which we currently have 28 of them. Uh, a lot of adjusting journal entries, booking revenue, and um, reconciliation of our liability accounts. So at her capacity as an accountant, these roles are better suited for more of an accounting clerk where she wants to be doing what she has done for us since joining us is basically that more in-depth auditing review and research. And it's a lot of work. Um, we have a very large quantity of accounting work for seven entities. Mm -hmm. And it's just not what she wants to be doing at this point. So are you, you'll be posting the job soon? I the job um, is posted. Tara, are you, are, you, are you confident in finding a replacement? We all know what the market is right now, so I hope, yes, that it'll be 
filled quickly, but. <clears throat> Uh, I'll let the board know that I did uh, hold an exit interview with Rose um, and saw if there's anything um, that we could change to have her stay. We really value her as an employee and I'll say she did really speak to wanting to pursue other opportunities that are less about staff accounting and more about like analysis. Um, and so and, and more like forensic type uh, accounting so she has served us really well has helped us go a long ways to cleaning our books up uh, and certainly we're going to miss her a great deal um, but the job is posted i also uh, had tara reach out to our accountants um, to ensure that they would support us with anything we may need in the meantime um, now jason and tara are getting up to speed quickly on the accounting piece so i don't think there's going to be a ton of support that we will need in the meantime but they were agreeable to do that so i just want you to know that this this i see this as certainly a loss for us but not something that should sidetrack us on the great um momentum we have going in the finance um, department of the su so no we're still committed to continue our trajectory forward yeah. Can I have a, a motion to accept her resignation with regret? So moved. So moved. All right. Um, here we go. Aaron? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Don? Don Shaw? Yes. Ethan? Yes. Meg? Yes. Michael? Yes. Uh, Rodney? Yes. Shannon? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Okay, so move. Accept her resignation. And we need an executive. Is there any other business before our executive session? Uh, we just want to change your next meeting date. Well, Stacey will be the new ways to the location. Yeah. That's what confused what happened last time. Okay. Because it still said Royalton campus. All right. And we will meet at the SU office on January 24th. Stacy, if you can, I don't know if you heard that, if you can change in your minutes the location to the SU office. All right, so Are you good? I'm done. I just got this in the executive session. Right, so you do need I need an executive session yeah. too. So there's two executive sessions then. All right. So we will have two executive sessions now. So does it work for that? No. So we're all done except for our executive sessions now. So we're back in the main call and is Ethan here? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, and good. Okay. Correct me if I get this wrong, but, uh, I would um, make a motion to come out of executive session. So I'd interrupt. Thank you. No, good. Good. Cause he's so moved or seconded. And we're recording again. So we're good now. Okay. Okay. Uh, the board moves to extend the board share of the health benefit for Pam Crino as poor 20 point 11 of the master agreement for a period of 60 days is that good do i have a second second Still seconded any discussion aaron yes Yes. On. Yes. Ethan. Yes. Michael. Yes. Rodney. Yes. 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 Thanks, guys. So moved. 
Make a motion into executive session for communication between privilege, uh, privilege communication between the auditor and um, the board, inviting Tara, I imagine. And Jamie. And Jamie. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Second. In just a minute, we'll stop recording. I think we'll be fine. Do we need to break up, Mom? I think we'll be okay. No one seems to be jumping on, and I can monitor. Um, but Parker will need to be there. Oh, uh, is Orca? No, Orca's still here. Yeah. We got to go to a breakout. All right, we got to go to a breakout, guys. Orca's still in the group somehow. No, she can jump on Parker. No, oh. that's fine. That's fine. Can you guys go to the breakout now? All right, guys, do I have a motion to come out of executive session with no action taken? So moved. Seconded. All right, we're out of executive session. Move to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Merry Christmas, everyone. If I don't happen to see you. Happy solstice. Yes. Days getting longer. All right, for the negotiation should be a short meeting. We pretty much. At what time, Kathy, again? 5.30. 5.30. It'll be a quick...